Hello, and welcome to Dorsey and Whitney's Privacy Titans and Tardigrades webinar. I'd like to introduce Jamie Nafziger, a partner and chair of Dorsey's Cybersecurity, Privacy, and Social Media Practice Group. Jamie? Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. So, tardigrades are adorable little creatures that are extremely tough. And those who are already tardigrade fans know that tardigrades can survive in extreme conditions. They can survive cold down to almost absolute zero. They can survive boiling in water for at least an hour. They can survive radiation. They can survive high pressure, low pressure as in the vacuum of space. And they can survive without oxygen or water. Tardigrades are also called water bears or moss piglets. Now, if you didn't think they were cool by what I've just told you, just hearing the words moss piglets hopefully will make you happy. I know it does make me feel happy. So there's a great YouTube channel called Mike, Mike Likes Science, and he's written a fun song about tardigrades or water bears. And the refrain goes something like this. No atmospheric pressure, water bears don't care. No oxygen or air, water bears don't care. Solar radiation, water bears don't care. Water bears don't care, water bears don't care. So by this refrain, Mike probably doesn't mean that water bears literally don't care if they don't have oxygen or air, but instead means that even though they might face one of these extreme conditions, water bears can survive and thrive and live to see another day. And that's why we've picked water bears or tardigrades to be our mascot for the day. We've all been through a lot in the last few years of COVID. And if we compare COVID to privacy laws, um, one common theme is waves. So we've seen, you could think of the first wave of privacy laws as GDPR, the European privacy law. And there might have been some minor variants after that, but for US companies, the second big wave was CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act. Now we're in a third wave. And unfortunately, there's no four letter acronym for it, but I would think of it as China, US states, and cross border transfer restrictions. So you could call it CUS CBT, but that doesn't really have a good ring to it. But just to set the stage for today, the work and the investment required to comply with this third wave is going to be equal or more than the previous two waves. So I wish we had different news for you today. I wish we could put on Leon Bridges' song, Smooth Sailing, and put it on repeat for three hours and drink mocktails. But unfortunately, that's not the case. We're going to throw a lot at you today. So in case you're starting to feel overwhelmed, we've got a few things for you. We've made a COVID and privacy related version of Water Bears Don't Care, which we will, and we also are going to be sending you a checklist at the end of the day that has a lot of the topics we're talking about and is will provide an easy way for you to um, assess your company's compliance with this third wave. So here's the COVID and privacy related version of Water Bears Don't Care. Working from our homes now, water bears don't care. Wearing PPE, water bears don't care. Children out of school, water bears don't care. Water bears don't care, water bears don't care. New laws in PRC, water bears don't care. Huge fines from the EU, water bears don't care. Big tech under fire, water bears don't care. Water bears don't care, water bears don't care. Ransomware attacks, now water bears don't care. Biometric lawsuits, water bears don't care. Lots of new state laws, water bears don't care. Water bears don't care, water bears don't care. Again, it's not that we don't care. It's just that we know that we can survive and make it through these um, issues together. Obviously it's gonna require, require prioritization because there's a lot going on. So let's get into it. First, a couple housekeeping announcements. 
Um, this water, uh, program is going to run from 8.30 to 11.50 Central. We have three 60-minute sessions with five-minute breaks that will feature tardigrade-themed songs, so enjoy those. Um, the materials and attendance form are available for download from a reminder email that you should have gotten yesterday, and if you want to get CLE credit, you should return your attendance form. Um, we have a lot to cover, so we're not going to be taking questions from the audience during the sessions, but please reach out to any of the speakers or your trusted Dorsey contact if you do have questions. And take a look in your email for our survey email that we'll send out later today. They will have a survey about the session and also the 2022 privacy roadmap or checklist that I mentioned. So here's our agenda for today. Um, we're going to start with the first session now, then have a short break. We'll do the international se session second, have another break, and then do the enforcement section and close by 11.50. So the speakers for our first session, um, me, as um, was mentioned, I'm the chair of the firm Cybersecurity Privacy and Social Media Practice Group. And my practice involves lots and lots of privacy compliance work, um, policies, agreements, giving advice about interfaces, assessments of cookies, pixels, and trackers, and internet issues, and that sort of thing. And I'm happy to say that I am in my 25th year at Dorsey this year, so it's kind of an anniversary year for me. Also joining me on this session are Carrie Lee Andkin, who's a patent prosecutor in the high tech space, but also helps with privacy compliance work. And Austin Chambers, who practices in the privacy and cybersecurity area, he um, helps develop privacy and security programs, draft privacy policies, and understand the legal and business risks related to the processing of personal and proprietary information and work on other technology transactions. And also joining us is Lizzie McGarrian, who helps clients build their business through commercialization and acquisition of intellectual property, securing key partnerships and navigating strategic mergers and acquisitions. She also works on technology agreements, including data processing agreements, which we're going to talk a lot more about today, and privacy policies. So welcome to my co-speakers. In this first session, we're going to talk about the new state privacy laws in California, Virginia, and Colorado. And we're going to feature some information on the phasing out of the employee and business to business exemptions that have been in effect in California uh, and what that's going to mean for your business. Then we'll talk about sensitive information, which is a newly defined term in some of these new laws and has changed over time and is going to take on increased importance as we get into the compliance required for this third wave of privacy laws. Then we'll turn to biometric and genetic privacy, which is also are both hot issues. And we have seen a lot of new laws being passed on both of these topics in the recent years. Um, our third panel is actually going to talk about biometric privacy enforcement, which has been a hot litigation area, but we're going to talk about the laws themselves in this session. And then finally, we'll talk about really important changes that are happening in the ad tech and um, internet platform areas that will really impact almost every US business and also talk about dark patterns, which is a new enforcement priority um, from state attorneys general and the FTC. So to, for the, I think we have, you know, looking at our attendance list, we have kind of a variety of practitioners here. So I'm gonna give a little bit of basics before we get into more details. As most people already know, we don't have a comprehensive privacy law like GDPR in the US. There, there have been numerous laws proposed over the last few years, um, but the key sticking points so far in the negotiations seem to be whether a federal privacy law would preempt these state laws that already exist now, such as California, Virginia, and Colorado, or and whether people would have a private right of action to sue for violations of the law like they do in California. Those uh, legislators have not been able to agree on those two issues, so we do not currently have a comprehensive law here. But we do have three important state laws that we're gonna talk about today. 
Um, the first one is the California Privacy Rights Act. Now, you probably have heard about the California Consumer Privacy Act or CCPA. This California Privacy Rights Act is really an amendment of the CCPA. And I think according to the regulators in um, California, we're gonna probably call this thing CCPA going forward. Um, this is an amendment of it. So we're gonna just talk about what's in the amendment because we've talked about what was in the original law quite a bit over the years. This amendment, which um, I'll talk about what it changes, but it will be operative January 1st of next year and the enforcement will start July 1st. And it's kind of a complex enforcement structure that we'll talk about in a second. Um, one of the big changes is that the there has been um, some differing opinions about whether the existing law covered sharing of personal information or what was really meant by the word sale or selling. And so some companies took the position that sharing information to um, third party vendors that might be then using that information for profiling of people was not selling under the law. Many and most took the position that it was selling as it is defined under CCPA, but this new amendment has clarified that so that there's no question about it anymore, whether you're selling or sharing, it's going to be covered by the law in California. It also adds, it has, you know, it keeps the consumer rights that existed, but adds a new one, which is the right to correct your personal information. So if you, you could now get a copy of what a company has about you, and you can then seek to correct it if something is wrong. Like if you have a common name and somehow somebody else's information has been associated with you, or if there are errors in the information. It requires data minimization. So to use the in, keep the minimal amount of it, first of all, collect the minimal amount you need, keep it for a minimal amount of time and you know, do the minimum required with it. It requires you to put out a data retention and publish a schedule about that your data retention, or at least explain your criteria for how you are going to decide when you're gonna keep data. One of the most significant changes is that we're gonna to have to make changes to the data processing agreements that companies have entered with their vendors. Um, <clears throat> this has been kind of a pain for companies as they originally had data processing agreements for GDPR, and then we had to amend them for CCPA, and now we're going to have to amend them again. Um, one of the, there's a lot of changes required, but one of them is that you will need to flow down your deletion um, obligations to your vendors. So that's um, one of the changes, but there are a bunch of them. And then <clears throat> because of the new amendments, we will also need to change privacy policies, or if you did a California supplement to your privacy policy, we'll need to revise those California supplements. <clears throat> For businesses, one of the good news, is, news about the new amendments is that they've expanded the definition of what's publicly available. So more things may be kind of outside of the law because of that exception. So that would be something to take a look at if that would be relevant for your company. There may be, you may need to enter an intra-corporate affiliate agreement for data sharing, um, depending on how your affiliates are branded. Uh, if you haven't already done that, you may need to do that now under the CPRA. <clears throat> CPRA all, CPRA also added to the list of data types that you would need to take action on if you had a data breach. So if you you need to update your records for that, there are new categories. Um, one of the other really significant changes is that they are creating an agency called the California Privacy Protection Agency. And this agency is charged with passing regulations um, to enforce CCPA and also um, to to enforce it through administrative proceedings. Um, the, I'll talk a little bit more about that agency because I think it's going to be a major player going forward for companies to pay attention to. Um, <clears throat> another change in CPRA is that 
companies may now need to conduct a risk assessment of all of their data processing and submit it to that agency if their processing poses a significant risk to consumers' privacy or security. Um, so some companies will need to do this, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, sensitive information, as I mentioned, is a really key issue, and Lizzie's going to talk about that next, so I won't go into it here, but that's a key issue for CPRA. And another really important thing is that as companies were working on their compliance a couple years ago, we knew that there was this 30-day cure period for most violations of CCPA, so people could rest a little more easily thinking, um, well, we're trying our best and if we got some technical thing wrong, we at least have 30 days to fix it. But that opportunity to cure is going to be phased out on January 1st. So that will no longer exist. The, um, <clears throat> another important thing that is changing is that there have been partial exemptions for employee data and business to business data those are going to end on January 1st. It's possible that these will be amended and I'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, for now, those are going to end. And that will have several significant consequences for companies who have California employees. First of all, if you haven't already done a privacy notice for employees and applicants, that would be something you should do now. That's actually already been required, but um, some companies have put that on the later part of their compliance path. So it's time to do that now. Um, <clears throat> also, if you took a pass on the B2B aspects of your data collection because that was exempted, it's time to reevaluate that now because those will become part of your compliance. And then probably one of the biggest changes and risk areas is that after January 1st, employees will have the same kind of rights as consumers have right now, the right to request copies of the information you have about them, the right to delete, the right to request corrections, all of those same rights. And we anticipate that those will be used by employees who are potentially going to sue their employers as kind of an early um, discovery process. So employment lawyers will need to think through how this is going to work and how they're going to respond to those requests in light of that risk. <clears throat> okay, the new uh, CPPA, the agency that's being created, it has been formed and they have appointed a chair and four other members of the board. Um, the chair is Jennifer Urban, who was a um, University of California Berkeley professor prior to taking on this role. Um, they have also now, the board has appointed their first executive director, Ashkan Sultani, and he was a former FTC commissioner, uh, commission, sorry, former FTC commission chief technologist. So the person who fully understands the technology, which seems very appropriate for this role. Um, I was just on a session with Jennifer Urban last week, and it sounds like the regulations that her agency are working on are going to come now in the second half of 2022. We thought it might come in maybe June, but it looks like it's getting pushed back. Um, but they do have several processes underway already. So they published a bunch of public comments, I think 900 pages of them. So that's out there. And then they're expecting to have information gathering sessions this month and roundtables next month where people will be able to give them feedback. Um, <clears throat> both the CPRA and Jennifer Urban talk a lot about dark patterns and Austin's gonna talk about this at the end of the presentation, but it's certainly an important area for California compliance. Also updating in California, um, California has a new attorney general as of April, Rob Bonta, and he's been putting out some guidance and other information since he became attorney general. He updated their frequently asked questions about the California Consumer Privacy Act to say that companies must honor a global privacy control signal as the equivalent of a do not sell request. So this relates to the do not track type activity that has been going on for years. Um, this is a very challenging thing for companies to do, um, but he has, at least in the FAQs, 
suggested that he is expecting companies to be doing this. I wanted to update you on what's been happening with the consumer requests under CCPA because we've now been dealing with those for a couple of years. There's four different types of requests that consumers can make. And right now the do not sell requests are the most common. Um, based on records from 2020, so a little while ago, um, the average business to consumer business gets about 137 requests per 1 million records. So it's a fair amount for many companies. They have a regular stream of these requests coming in and have had to staff up to deal with the requests. The requests do have a verification process for three of the four types of requests and nearly half of the requests won't be verified once you start your verification process. So they kind of die after the first request. Um, organizations that use a form that has a CAPTCHA have a lot fewer unverified requests. So if you're wanting to deal, you know, like screen out some of the junk requests, that would be a way that you could introduce a system that would help you do that. Um, the CCPA requires an update of your privacy policy every 12 months. So we're recommending that if your privacy policy says it's more than 12 months ago, you go back and do some updates. That would be a really obvious thing that a regulator could look at to say that you're not keeping up with the law. There are some pending amendments, as I mentioned. Um, there were just a flurry of amendments in February um, that were introduced, and we believe that they will, will have a sense by the end of August which ones will pass, but two of them are important here. One is proposing that the employee and B2B exemptions will continue indefinitely. And one is proposing that those exemptions will, will be extended until 2026. So if either of those pass, that will lessen the burden for companies, but it's unclear whether they'll pass or not. Um, last year, we saw comprehensive privacy bills introduced in over 25 states of the country. So a lot of activity in the state legislatures, but they passed in two states, Virginia and Colorado, and we're going to talk about those. Some of the commonalities between these two laws are that they both grant certain consumers similar rights to, as they have under the CCPA. So the right to know and access their personal information, the right to opt out of certain types of processing, the right to correct their personal information and the right to delete their personal information. What's different um, in part from California is that these laws will be enforced by the state attorney general. In California, we have enforcement by both the state attorney general and that new agency that's being formed. In Colorado, district attorneys can also enforce the Colorado law. Neither Colorado nor Virginia have a private right of action, so that should reduce the risk somewhat for companies. But um, there are a lot of complexities on the edge. So there's a lot of similarities between these laws, but there are a lot of complexities kind of on the edges. So some of the exemptions and exceptions differ. So for instance, there's health related exemptions. And Colorado will exclude only the personal health information, whereas Virginia will cover, will exclude the entity itself. And both of them exempt financial institutions that are subject to Graham Leach Bliley. Colorado applies to nonprofits, but Virginia does not. So um, one of the key things for most companies and organizations is going to be just those kind of screening questions to figure out if it applies to you or not. So a little more about the Virginia Consumer Data Protection Act. It will go into effect January 1st, um, just like the California changes. It applies to businesses that control or process data for at least 100,000 consumers, or that make 50% of their gross revenue from the sale of personal data and have personal data of at least 25,000 consumers. So if you've got 100,000 consumers and you're, you, get, you have consumers from Virginia, you're probably within scope of this business or this law. Um, but unlike California, 
Virginia does not cover people acting in their commercial or employment context. So the B2B and employment exceptions are in force in Virginia. They have a broader opt out of processing than California, which is a little tricky because it will make it harder to just use the exact same processes for Virginia as we've been using for California. So that would be definitely something to take a look at. Um, they also have introduced a definition of affirmative consent that would be good to review as you look at your workflow of how you introduce these policies to people and get them to agree to them. They do require data processing agreements with third parties. Um, one of the things that's going to be really new for some US companies is data protection assessments. Now, if you've done these for um, Europe, these are familiar to you. But if you have not, then this is going to be a new thing for US companies. Um, it basically is a process of reviewing the information you're collecting and what you're doing with it, who you're sharing with it, how sensitive is it, and then documenting all of that in a form that you would be uh, okay with turning over to a regulator when they came and asked for it. Sensitive information is going to be a key aspect of this law, and Lizzie's going to talk about that in a minute. There is a 30-day cure period in Virginia, so um, at least for now, that's there will be a little wiggle room um, if, if somebody claims that you're not doing things exactly right. They have formed a work group to um, study this law and make recommendations about it, and they've been actively doing that. So I expect we'll have some updates from that. There are currently seven amendments pending of this law. So in this year, 2022, we'll be keeping our eye on those because they may change some of the key things. Colorado Privacy Act um, took, is going to take effect six months or, or I guess a little longer, seven months after these other ones, July 31st of next year. Um, to be within scope of the Colorado privacy law, you need to be located in Colorado or intentionally targeting Colorado consumers, and then either controlling or processing personal data of more than 100,000 Colorado consumers per calendar year, or deriving revenue from the sale of personal data of at least 25,000 Colorado consumers, unless you meet some of the exemptions. So basically 100,000 is the number you should be looking at. Um, it, Like Virginia, it doesn't include people acting in their commercial or employment context. So right now, California is the only law that covers those folks. It has similar rights um, to these other two laws we were talking about. And they are also looking at this universal opt-out signal, like I was talking about the do not track from California, and they're, they're working on regulations related to that. Um, like these other two laws, data processing agreements are required. And in Colorado, there's also data protection assessments, which is that process of reviewing and documenting your data collection that I was talking about. Sensitive data is also really important. <clears throat> Excuse me, data minimization is required and Colorado has a 60 day cure period. Um, Colorado Attorney General Phil Weiser is um, in charge of the regulations and he's got a rulemaking underway now. He's expecting or his goal is to have the final rules by January of next year. So we're expecting to hear more about that throughout this year. Um, one of the hot issues in privacy and cybersecurity over the last few years is how do you define reasonable security? And I just wanted to note that if you're uh, into the security aspect of this topic, um, Phil Weiser gave a speech on January 28th where he talked in detail about how he defines reasonable security. And I would um, recommend that uh, speech to you if you're trying to you know, get a little more sense of what these regulators are expecting. He's also very active with the dark patterns area that we'll talk about later. Comparing these laws, you know, there, there are going to be some parts that we'll, we'll be able to design that are the same for all three states and some things that will need to be special for each state. The consumer rights are fairly similar. Um, there's some differences in deletion rights. 
Um, one thing that's new with Colorado and Virginia is there's a right to appeal denials. So if a consumer requests something from you and you deny it, they can appeal. So that's going to be something new for companies to work through. Um, the definitions of sell are different. Colorado is similar to California in that it's a very broad definition, whereas in Virginia, it has to involve monetary consideration, so it's a little narrower. The exceptions to these laws differ. Um, and then both of these two new laws require the data protection assessments for companies that are doing things that are a little more risky for consumers. However, when I look at the list of what they say is a little more risky, um, it's pretty common. So I think many, many companies will need to do these data protection assessments. Targeted advertising is, I mean, of all the companies I work with, virtually all of them are doing that. Um, sale of personal data under California and also Colorado, that's going to be almost every company. Um, certain profiling activities, the use of sensitive data, and a heightened risk of harm are the types of things that would force you into being required to do one of these data protection assessments. One of the key things is going to be documenting that data protection assessment and having it in a ready form that you could give it to one of the regulators if they come to you. I'm gonna turn it over to Lizzie now to talk about sensitive personal information, which is a key concept for all companies uh, in the US. Jamie, thanks so much for that great introduction and for all of that thoughtful information and um, while water bears may not care about nuclear pressure, it seems they do care about sensitive personal information. So that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. So when you think about sensitive personal information, a lot of it is probably obvious. It's the things that are confidential and that need to be kept safe and out of reach from all outsiders, unless they have permission to access it. So take a look at the list, social security, your driver's license, anything related to your identification, I know a lot of folks on the line probably have account login information or things like financial data, passwords, credentials. Something that Virginia is putting on the list that may not be so obvious is your precise geolocation. Racial and ethnic origin are important data points to keep safe for obvious reasons. Religious and philosophical beliefs, union membership, Contents of a consumer's mail or email, text messages, unless the business is the intended recipient. So this is all personal data that requires a special degree of protection since it's sensitive personal, because of its sensitive personal nature and the potential for discrimination based on this information. Next slide, please. Continuing on with uh, what is considered sensitive personal information, genetic data, biometric information, personal information about a consumer's health. Um, notably, Colorado can, considers personal information collected and analyzed about a person's sex life or sexual orientation to be personal and sensitive, although maybe all states should consider that sensitive and personal. Um, personal information is broadly not supposed to be publicly available. Next slide, please. So you're probably asking yourself, okay, I've got this laundry list of what might be considered sensitive information in various states. Can I process it? And if so, how? So here we've got our slide that has our two regimes for how each of the three states that Jamie teed up treat processing sensitive, sensitive information. On the left, Colorado and Virginia has what we're going to refer to as the consent model. So you're going to have to seek consent to process sensitive data and then perform one of those tricky data processing assessments that Jamie talked about. She introduced the fact that GDPR requires these. And so for uh, our clients and friends on the line who have performed a data processing assessment for purposes of the GDPR, you're already ahead of the game. Here in the US, most of us are probably new to that. Um, so Colorado and Virginia, we're thinking about our consent and we're thinking about a data processing assessment. On the right-hand side, for the purposes of California, we've got what probably where you want to be is your green text. Limited purposes would be allowed. 
if you're not using sensitive personal data for limited purposes, you're going to get into this notice and opt out framework. So um, perhaps those of you who are really ahead of the game already know what notice means. Notice means your privacy policy. So Jamie teed this up that every 12 months that should be updated. Certainly with these new state laws, you should be taking a look at your notice and whether it tackles what you're doing with sensitive data um, and gives your customers and folks who are interacting with you the notice of what you're going to be doing with that. In addition to the notice, you're going to need to provide the opt-in or opt-out option. Uh, Jamie talks a little bit about signals. I think that is going to be prospective and something we'll be thinking about in the future. Right now, most of you on the line thinking about your California sensitive data, that's going to be a clear and conspicuous link here. So for California, it's important to know that we're only talking about sensitive data for the purpose of inferring characteristics about a company. On the left, Colorado and Virginia, where we've got our consent model, that's pretty much for anything. And for California, we are thinking about sensitive information for the purpose of inferring characteristics about a consumer. Next slide, please. So you're probably asking yourself, okay, so now I understand that there are a long list of things that are considered sensitive. I'm going to have to be thoughtful about how I process them. How do I move forward and act in a way that the regulators find to be acceptable? What are the practical takeaways that I can move forward with from Lizzie's part of the presentation? So here, know your data map. What are you processing? What's coming in the door? Um, if you don't know what you are collecting, then there's no way you're going to comply with the laws. So, you know, get with your IT folks and start to understand what's going on with your data map. Confirm consent. So, we talked about how to get consent and on the previous slide. Um, Jamie also talked a lot about your existing CCPA and GDPR processes. Everyone on the line probably has already been thinking about these topics. You probably have a privacy policy. You may have gone through the data processing assessment. And if you've already done that, you've got a framework to leverage. Privacy professionals can help you move forward and tweak what you already have uh, in place to be compliant with these new laws that are already here and that will be coming down the pike in other states. I think a really practical Order that we can put around data collection that will help you move forward in an efficient way is to only collect personal information that you have a legitimate business need to have. Um, don't sell data if that's not core to your business and only collect what you need to perform your business. Um, limiting your data collection to what, only what is necessary will use compliance efforts. So we really encourage you to um, perform that data mapping, identify how you're processing your sensitive information, follow these points on the slide and reach out to privacy professionals like my colleagues who've joined here to think about your privacy policy, your data processing agreements with your third party vendors and what exactly you have, how you're using it, how you're notifying customers, and whether you have the rights that these new laws require. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lizzie. I know we're focused today on California, Colorado, and Virginia, but I did want to mention a few other state law changes that happened in 2021, just so that they're on your radar if you're not aware of them. Um, Nevada had an, an existing requirement that people put certain language on their privacy policy related to their website. Um, that has now been expanded to data brokers. So if you work for a company that's kind of behind the scenes getting data, you may have some new requirements you need to meet for Nevada. Last year, over 50 other new state privacy and cybersecurity laws passed. Um, there were just so many of them. Um, in reviewing them, I've come up with a few themes of where I saw multiple states passing laws about this. One is that there was a big focus um, 
on enhancing the cybersecurity protection of our government, both federally, state and local governments and agencies. So there were a lot of laws related to that and related to um, data breach in connection with um, state government held or state or local or federal government held information. There were also a lot of um, laws related to cybersecurity in the insurance industry. So if that's your industry, you should check out some of the new state laws that may apply to you. And then a lot of election security laws, unsurprisingly, that was a key issue that many states addressed. There were four other laws that I wanted to call out specifically because they're, I think, kind of a, a bigger deal for companies. One is a new law in Florida that's being called a mini TCPA. So if, you're, if your company does telephone or text message marketing, you're familiar with the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, TCPA. This is a new Florida law that sets telephone solicitation requirements. So if you're soliciting by telephone in Florida, you should check this one out. Um, there's a new New York law that requires businesses that monitor or intercept employee communication or internet usage to notify employees in writing of these practices. Many employers already do that, but um, if you don't and you have employees in New York, that would be a good law to take a look at. Virginia has a new law that relates to using people's identification cards or driver's licenses. So if you collect that kind of information, like a scan of those, um, it would be good to review this new Virginia law. And then um, one of the big trends in data privacy has related to um, automated decision making or algorithmic transparency where companies are using computer algorithms to help make decisions or narrow down pools of candidates or things like that. New York City actually has passed a local law that will take effect in January for employers or employment agencies that use automated employment decision tools to do an independent audit of the tools for bias and post the results publicly on the website and then provide disclosures to candidates and employees at least 10 business days prior to using the tools. So um, if you have a location in New York City, um, that would be a good one to take a look at as well. Um, what should we be looking at for 2022? As I mentioned last year, 25 states introduced comprehensive privacy legislation. We're going through that similar thing again. Many states have introduced legislation. Um, some of them have passed one house of the state legislature. So I wanted to just call those out specifically, Indiana, Oklahoma, Utah, and Wisconsin. So those are a little further along than the other ones and maybe those will proceed. I wouldn't be surprised if we have more laws going into next year. In fact, our cybersecurity, privacy, and social media group has a little uh, gambling going on as to how many new ones we'll see. Um, Another interesting trend that is happening is that the Uniform Law Commission put out a comprehensive model bill last year called the Uniform Personal Data Protection Act. It has only been introduced in one jurisdiction so far, Washington, DC, but it's possible that like other model bills we've seen that it will be introduced in other state legislatures. So far, I've seen a lot of criticism of this law, um, mainly because it's based on a completely different um, principles and format than these other laws we've talked about. So it would be a whole additional regime for companies to try to understand and come into compliance with. But it is out there and we'll see, maybe it will take off or be the basis for a federal law. And now we're gonna turn it over to Carrie Lee. There you go, thanks Jamie. So while biometric information uh, used by law enforcement has been in the news quite a bit recently for this presentation, just to keep it focused, uh, we're sticking to biometric laws that apply to uh, private entities and their use of biometric information. Next. 
So biometric information is typically used to refer to various physical characteristics that can be used to identify an individual. Common uses you're probably familiar with is using your fingerprint or facial recognition to unlock your phone. Some laws definitions of biometric data are quite broad, such as California's, and it encompasses additional information such as behavioral and genetic information. It even includes things like sleep, health, or exercise data, if somehow that could be used to identify an individual. Um, other states have very narrow and very limited definitions of biometric information. For example, Texas is very specific to retina or iris scan, fingerprint, voice print record, or face geometry. And so that is extremely narrow. And certain states like my own Washington and also Illinois, their definitions of biometric data, if you look at that, um, spend more time telling you what biometric information is not. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that they don't want to include information that might be covered under other laws. For example, Illinois has its own genetic privacy law that covers certain information, and uh, most states want to avoid conflicting with HIPAA, which is federal legislation. Next slide, please. So currently, only a, a few states have specific biometric privacy laws. However, several states include biometric information in their definition of personal information, especially um, sensitive information in just their general privacy or data breach notification laws. Um, as you already learned from Lizzie earlier on, if something is classified as sensitive information, it may have heightened requirements in terms of disclosure, consent, and protection. So even if you're in a state that doesn't have specific biometric privacy law legislation, you may be having to protect this information at that heightened level of sensitive information. And I just wanted to let you know that all these examples lists uh, are not uh, exhaustive. So there are other states that may have this in their general privacy or data breach notification laws. Uh, right now, only Illinois, Texas, and Washington have what I would call general biometric information legislation. Uh, I'll touch on those a little bit more detail in the next slide. Um, other states have very targeted biometric legislation that focuses on very specific types of biometric information and uses. For example, New York State has a law specific to fingerprints and prohibiting the use of fingerprinting as a condition of employment. And um, some other states have put, or actually even like much more local jurisdictions like cities like Baltimore um, and Portland have put restrictions on the use of facial recognition. Next slide, please. So as I noted um, on the previous slide, Illinois, Texas, and Washington currently have the most comprehensive biometric specific state legislation. Roughly speaking, Washington is a watered down version of the Texas legislation, and the Texas legislation is a watered down version of the Illinois legislation. So the Texas and Washington laws, they provide more flexibility for obtaining consent and transferring and selling biometric information. And I'll note Washington has the narrowest scope as it explicitly excludes biometric information collected for security purposes. Texas does not have this exclusion and Illinois is the broadest. It, it covers uh, pretty much all use of biometric information from private entities. They know Illinois privacy law is the most onerous. It has the broadest scope. It has toughest disclosure and consent requirements, requires written consent, and prevents all profiting from biometric information, even with consumer consent. Also, unlike Texas and Washington, it has a private right of action, which has led to significant litigation. Um, as Jamie already mentioned, uh, Bob Katnock in a later session will we'll talk more about the litigation under Illinois laws. Next slide, please. So the future state laws, uh, California has introduced uh, a bill that would amend the CPRA to include similar requirements to Illinois law. However, they will keep that much broader definition of biometric information that I used. So it could end up encompassing more information uh, than, than Illinois. And then New York also has some legislation prohibiting biometric information from being used for marketing purposes. And then Oklahoma has, again, another 
very specific legislation that's tied only to voice recognition. And Austin Chambers is going to talk a little bit more about voice recognition and those issues later on. Now, even if these bills pass, there's still only a handful of states that'll have specific biometric privacy laws. But as I noted earlier, you could still be having to protect this information um, at higher levels based on the classification as sensitive information in a state's general privacy or data breach notification law. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, moving on to genetic information. Uh, again, I'm gonna focus on laws that apply to uh, private entities, not government use. Next slide, please. So genetic information uh, refers to data related to an individual's DNA sequence. You know, information might include just the specific order of the base pairs in the DNA strand, but it could also include the presence or lack of a gene or a chromosome. For example, trisomy 21, which is an extra copy of the 21 chromosome, which is an indicator of Down syndrome. It could include the presence or lack of a mutation. The famous one is the BRCA2 mutation linked to breast and other cancers. But it can also include things like RNA, as messenger RNA may be used to determine portions of a person's DNA or gene expression levels. Now, originally, you know, genetic sequencing was prohibitively expensive and it was rarely available outside of research and medical treatment contexts. Um, however, because of the improvements in sequencing, it's gone down in cost quite a bit in recent years. And that's made it feasible to have consumer focused sequencing products such as the popular at home ancestry kits. I know there's a Christmas a few years ago where it seemed like that's what the, the hot gift was. Everyone had these DNA sequencing kits. Uh, next slide, please. So now that we're getting these, this genetic information collected in what would be considered non-traditional settings, uh, some states have passed legislation to provide protection of genetic information because before it had mostly been protected by HIPAA, but since it's being collected outside the medical environment, a lot of times it's not covered and doesn't have any protection under existing laws. Uh, similar to, to biometric data though, several states protect genetic information as personal or sensitive information as part of their general privacy or data breach notification laws. I know that with like California's definition, it's collected into their biometric information definition. And again, the list on the slide of examples are, are not exhaustive. Some states have enacted legislation generally covering collection and use of genetic information, whereas others have recently passed laws that are very specific to certain industries that are collecting and using uh, genetic information. And, and when we're talking about these genetic privacy laws, I just want to note that these are different than some of the existing legislation, such as the Federal Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, because this those laws cover what genetic information could be used for, like not being able to deny employment or charging more for insurance, things like that. So they're more on the lines of anti-discrimination and those laws don't necessarily protect genetic information from disclosure or being requested or collected in the first place. Next slide, please. Oops. Right, this is slide is just provides a few examples of state genetic privacy laws that cover a, a wide variety of entities. This shows Alaska, Nevada, and Florida, but other states with similar legislation include Arizona and Oregon. Um, while these three states on this slide have criminal penalties for violations, Alaska and Nevada are limited to misdemeanors. Uh, in contrast, Florida, which is a more recent law, the statute may carry felony charges, uh, but kind of somewhat to balance that possibly. Um, unlike Alaska and Nevada, Florida doesn't provide a private right of action. And all of these various statutes have various exceptions for law enforcement, paternity, child support disputes, and they also tend to exclude medical care, mostly to avoid overlapping or conflicting with HIPAA. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, some states have very industry-specific uh, legislation 
some of the recent tests in California, Utah, and Arizona, they've passed these laws that are very specific to the at-home testing companies. They're, these are like your Ancestry and 23andMe. Um, it's shown here, the legislation requires these companies to have written privacy policies, certain disclosures, protecting the information with a certain level of security and restricting when they can disclose it. Uh, they also give consumers more control over this genetic information, so to opt out of research or other uses of the, their genetic information, and also allows consumers to have their DNA samples destroyed, sort of a genetic right to be forgotten. Um, and so I think we may be seeing more of these later on. Next slide, please. Uh, in other Another industry that's really been a focus of some of these privacy laws are insurance companies. South Dakota and Florida have genetic privacy laws uh, again, for insurance companies. And there's sort of a hybrid between the privacy and anti-discrimination laws. So in addition for requirements for collection and disclosure, the laws have restrictions as to what insurance companies can use the genetic information for. For example, South Dakota prohibit certain insurance companies for requesting or requiring genetic information for particular purposes. And interesting, South Dakota also regulates when an at-home testing company can provide information to insurance companies. Now, just because the legislation may not protect, it protects the genetic information itself, it doesn't necessarily protect information that's derived from the genetic information. In particular, like Florida law, it allows insurance companies to use a diagnosis or condition, even if it came from genetic information. So if you had, say, a genetic test that was allowed your doctor to diagnose you with uh, Huntington's disease, the insurance company could use that information, even though it came from genetic information. Next slide. Okay. So this is just a, a quick summary of what we went over um, the recent legislation we just discussed. Uh, and although we focus on private entity, I just wanted to note here, Florida, Maryland, and Montana have passed some laws that restrict government use of genetic information, particularly in the criminal context. Some of this legislation is in response to concerns that arose after law enforcement was able to go through private genetic data on these ancestry sites to uh, find the Golden State Killer. So there was some concern about possible abuses and overreach in the future. Uh, and again, similar to biometric information, while only some states have specific genetic information legislation, please be aware that genetic information, you know, it may be included in a state's definition of personal or sensitive information in its general privacy date, privacy or data breach notification laws. Thanks for your time, and I'll hand you off to Jamie and Austin. Thank you, Carrie Lee. Austin, take it away. All right. Well, thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Carrie Lee. So I wanted to take the, the next few minutes here just to kind of tie everything together and focus on a few of the big issues that we're kind of worrying about and um, seeing across clients kind of some of the processing that's really being implicated by these privacy laws, uh, you know, changing in the U.S. and um, really what they're focusing on in their business is kind of the highest risk issues. So the first thing up um, is facial recognition. As Carrie Lee mentioned, uh, facial recognition is increasingly common. Of course, it empowers a lot of cool products and services, you know, whenever Facebook, you know, identifies your friends in photos or, you know, or Apple on your device, you know, identifies that it's your wife or your kid um, in your images and, you know, lets you pull, you know, cur curates albums and things like that on your behalf. It's all, you know, pretty cool, right? Um, but again, what we're looking at now is, uh, you know, given this in particular Illinois, which has a private right of action, has specific requirements around the collection, use, disclosure of biometric information. Of course, all these new state privacy laws that define biometric information somewhat generally, you, you know, without regulations or anything at this point, we're really seeing a lot of clients focus on, on facial recognition, trying to figure out what they need to do to comply, what they really need to do to get consent. Um, and so I wanted to just kind of flag this as an issue and you know, think through this. You know, spatial recognition, what you know, we understand, you know, from the definitions that Carrie Lee kind of went over. Um, Honestly, it's pretty hard to run a facial recognition service without creating something like biometric information. All of these really depend on what's called a face print. Um, we see that definition pop up. Uh, we don't know exactly what that's going to look like in some of the new privacy laws yet, but um, we kind of understand that this is sort of integral to the um, 
integral to any facial recognition service. So we just wanted to flag this as a big issue and also kind of drill down on this a little bit with a case study that you might have heard of, which is Clearview AI. It's a company, they're a service provider. They, um, they basically sell facial recognition as a service. Uh, they have curated all of their facial recognition through largely public photos. They have then created face prints, linked identifying information to it. Um, and then uh, they have basically sold this off as a service that they're selling to surveillance companies, private individuals, private investigators, um, and doing some things that you know might push the boundaries of you know what we might consider to be common ethics. But um, in any event, this has resulted in them being sued under the uh, Biometric Information Privacy Act in Illinois. Um, with a few key uh, questions. Uh, again, first off, you know, they're arguing essentially that this information was public. It's a photo. They just derived this information. But of course, the, the plaintiffs are pushing back saying that they, you know, should have got consent. Um, of course, this is a, you know, their entire business model depends on this. Um, and also another interesting piece coming out of this case, and uh, we might hear more about this later, um, the harm. So under BIPA, you're allowed to get damages range from $1,000 to $5,000 per incident. Um, so significant damages, but the other issue is that this can also include actual damages if they're greater. And so some of what they're drilling down on in this case and trying to prove here is particular harm to marginalized communities um, and individuals and minorities as a result of this, because again, they're being profiled, you know, their police departments are using this service, you know, to try to identify them. And of course, AI is, and facial recognition is notoriously inaccurate um, as applied to minority uh, populations. So this has been something uh, you know, again, to watch uh, in particular, both from the private right of action, from the, you know, definitions of data, and also going on to the damages themselves. So something we wanted to flag for you. Another one, another big issue right now is voice recognition. Uh, this is an interesting one in particular, because we're starting to push the boundaries here of what is, is exactly biometric information. Uh, of course, voice recognition, these are services that basically identify what people are going to say. It doesn't always define who is going to say it. So think Siri on one hand, um, you know, understanding that it's you asking Siri to, you know, open your phone versus a police officer or, um, you know, somebody that just wants to say, you know, hi, turn on the lights. Alexa may not care so much exactly who's talking to it. Right. And so this gets into, um, and in particular, uh, you know, a particular distinction. And so lots of companies trying to, you know, activate use voice recognition services. And really it come, what it comes down to is the structure of these services, the actual data that they're, they're collecting and using uh, is, is particularly important. Um, in whether or not uh, this is actually going to be subject to these biometric privacy laws and, you know, of course, the attendant rights, private rights of action, consent requirements, and so on. Um, and again, this kind of plays directly into AI and automation, which is, a, you know, just a broader issue outside of these two, you know, sensitive, potentially biometric uh, data points. Um, you know, we're just seeing companies collecting data of all kinds, you know, automating anything and everything that they possibly can. And so what I think, you know, what we're seeing increasingly with clients here is that as you start to offer AI as a service or automation as a service, we run into some particular issues. And we have, again, sensitive data on one hand, but again, just regular personal information, just transferring that between third parties, um, as we're seeing under CCPA, under CPRA, and the other emerging state laws, um, these could, it could potentially be considered a data sale. Because again, you're giving personal information to your vendor. They're using it. They're developing a service. They probably have to keep that data. Um, and so increasingly, we're seeing, seeing potential risks and trying to figure out how to structure and limit um, AI automated services, you know, such that we can avoid the data sale issues. Um, and we can do that through anonymization, you know, potentially, but again, how effective is that? What do we need to do to anonymize information successfully? All uh, issues to pay attention to. Um, and I would note another emerging issue on the AI side, in addition to whether or not you can create your data sets, we have emerging issues around transparency. And so if, your AI automation is going to result in legal or similarly significant effects. You may have a right to receive meaningful information about the logic and the effects of you know, this processing on you. So nobody really knows what that means, but um, trying to describe in your public notice is exactly what your technology does. Increasingly important, being able to articulate that both internally and externally, I think are gonna become you know, emerging challenging issues. Um, and again, whether or not someone has the right to opt out. Um, this is happening as well, again, where there are legal or similarly significant effects, but also even if it's a data sale, again, individuals have a right to opt out. So you may or may not be able to support that in the development of a machine learning system. Next slide, please. Um, so another thing, another big emerging issue is the fact that, is the power of platforms. We've all seen, you know, how big platforms have sort of taken over everything uh, in the last few years, but they're also driving a lot of change in the privacy world in addition to private litigation or private legislation or in you know, 
in the States. So what we see from these private companies is um, increasingly Apple, they've really been pushing the boundaries. They have stopped allowing a lot of the data collection and processing that has powered um, you know, a lot of companies, in particular in the advertising uh, space over the last few years. And so we've seen Apple cracking down on cross app disclo um, data disclosure. So, you know, disclosing one, uh, you know, data from one app to another app that they can use to drive advertising. They've really cabined that down to what's being processed as necessary for the app to operate um, to the exclusion largely of marketing or data driven business models. Um, Google and Apple both are really pushing for independent disclosures in the app stores about your processing, basically requiring you to replicate your privacy policy in a sort of nutrition label um, that every user will see. So this creates a potential issue around dueling privacy notices. You have a privacy, like privacy policy, but you also have a separate disclosure in the app store. So um, kind of a big issue there. Again, Apple's cracking down on the collection of information from your app. So identifying information, they're anonymizing emails really, really pushing back against anything that can be used to link users' devices across services. So a big deal. Google, similarly, um, is deprecating third-party cookies in Chrome. Uh, this already exists today in Firefox and some other browsers, but um, you know, really what this has resulted in is uh, increasing the value and focus on first-party data, contextual advertising, the entire advertising and marketing uh, you know, workspace is changing. So uh, you know, important to note this in particular because you know, the platforms, you know, Apple, Google, um, big contractual risks, um, you know, non-compliance gets you booted out of the app store. And for some companies, that's a big, that's a big problem. And that, of course, you know, could uh, result in your loss of access to the marketplace. Um, next slide. Uh, the last thing to notice, to note is around a lot of this stuff, you know, if you opt out, you know, of under exercise your right to opt out under current privacy laws, you may be required to opt in. Similarly, if you're processing sensitive information, you may have a right to consent to opt in. What we're seeing today, you know, these the notion of dark patterns um, is basically you know, how, how are we going to get consent? How are companies able to encourage um, the individuals to provide this information? And um, again, increasingly, both under consumer protection laws and also under California law and Colorado law, any um, any interface designed to manipulate an individual's choice and in whether or not they provide consent uh, may be unlawful and can result in damages or injunctions. So uh, thinking through about how you request consent is becoming increasingly important as well. And of course, automated opt-outs are coming um, and to be defined by regulation, but uh, your advertising opt-outs may be automatic when someone uses an app or a browser. That's all I've got. Thank you so much, Austin. That was great. And thanks to all the other speakers. We're going to move to a very short break here and rejoin at 940 Central Time. <laughs> 